These are African rhythms passed down to us through ancient spirits. Feel the spirit, a unifying force. Come on, move with the spirit. Stand up, clap your hands. Move with the rhythm, just get down. From WSNC 90.5 FM, a broadcasting service and NPR affiliate of Winston-Salem State University, welcome to Africa World Now Project. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. Today, of spirit and black liberation. Africa World Now Project is next. Amadou Hapati Ba, quoting his teacher Chirno Bakar, suggests that writing is one thing and knowledge is another. Writing is the photograph of knowledge, but it is not knowledge itself. Knowledge is a light that is in man. It is the heritage of all that our ancestors have known. It is in the germ that they transmit to us, just as the baobab tree is potentially in its seed. According to Hapati Ba, The world's earliest archives or libraries were the brains of men, and I must add women. Nothing proves a priori that writing gives a more faithful account of a reality than oral evidence handed down from generation to generation. The chronicles of modern war serve to show that, as is said in Africa, each party or nation sees high noon from its doorway. Through the prism of its own passions, our mentality, our interest, our eagerness to justify its point of view. Moreover, written documents were not themselves always secure against deliberate forgeries or unintentional alterations at the hands of successive copyists, phenomena which inter alia, among other things, give rise to controversies over, quote, holy writ. Now, this is not to argue or suggest that one form of knowledge production, oral or written, is more important than another. But what is important is that one does, in fact, precede the other. The written word is not without thought. The written word, without being refined through action and interaction, which is articulated through normal, is without power. Without nomo, the African conceptualization of the energy within the spoken word, the power that carries an energy that produces all life and influences everything, is the principle upon which the world of meaning is built. Without nomo, power is debased. By human utterance or through spoken word, human beings can invoke a kind of spiritual power. Nomo, the generative power of the spoken word, is the force that gives life to everything. It is present everywhere and it brings into existence all that is seen and unseen. The process of moving thought to word is not without value and rooted in a constellation of influences. However, It is here that Hampati Ba suggests that we pay attention to what is involved in the formulation of thought to word. More specifically, Hampati Ba suggests that we pay attention to the source from which we pull or receive information. We must follow the map of evidence. Ba writes that we should pay attention to what is behind the evidence itself, the actual value of who is giving the evidence, the value of the train of transmission of which one is a part of, the trustworthiness of the individual and collective memory, and the price attached to the truth in a given society. In short, the bond between man and the spoken word must be understood. Over a millennium, many of us have encapsulated this deep tradition in a simple phrase, word is bond. Therefore, the embodiment of knowledge, the ethic to which one holds themselves to transmit this knowledge necessitates the importance to understand where and when the knowledge of the world, a world that is just, equitable, and collective comes into conflict with the structures that devalue this ethic, this ethos. What am I saying here? The vitality of resistance and radicalism starts first with self and an understanding of how this self comes into conflict with the contradictions of European modernity, conceptualized as an individual divorced from the collective, understanding of relationships, relationships that include nature and the universe. It is this space and between space that spirit and liberation merge to become a sustained resistance. Our training as so-called scholars and education in the West has been divorced and scattered from this deep tradition. This is why we can have folk who claim radicalism in one area of living, 
but be neoliberal in another. They can claim, for instance, that land is central to black liberation, but champion its private ownership. There's no recognition of the contradictions, let alone an attempt to struggle against them. This struggle is essential to building a mass movement. According to Habati Ba in African traditions, the spoken word had, beyond its fundamental moral value, a sacred character associated with this divine origin. An exceptional conductor of magic, grand vector of ethereal forces. It was not to be treated lightly. C.L.R. James articulated this concisely when he asserted that you don't play with revolution. Many religious, magical, or social factors then combine to preserve the faithfulness of oral transmission. Contrary to what some may think, African oral tradition is not limited to stories and legends or even mythological and historical tales. In the griot, what Ba calls a wandering menstrual poet, as conceptualized by the French, is far from being its one and only qualified guardian and transmitter. Oral tradition is the great school of life, all aspects of which are covered and affected by it. It may seem chaotic to those who do not penetrate its secrets. It may baffle the Cartesian mind, accustomed to dividing everything up into clear-cut categories. In oral tradition, in fact, spiritual and material are not disassociated. Passing from the esoteric to the exotoric, oral tradition is able to put itself within man's reach, speaking to them according to their understanding, unveil itself in accordance to their aptitude. It is at once religion, knowledge, natural science, apprenticeship, and a craft, history, entertainment, recreation, since at any point of detail can always take us all the way back to the primordial unity. What does all of this point to? For what purpose and to what ends does this introductory exploration provide our current engagement that you will hear today? How does it connect? The simplicity of the answer is found in understanding its complexity. The simple answer is that it provides a frame within which we can identify and extract the multiple points where spirit and black resistance converge. Whether it is evident as the spark of the Haitian Revolution are found interwoven in the vibrations of John Coltrane's Love Supreme. Deeper levels of spirit and black resistance are always converging. While the complexity is found in our willingness to map its evolution and stand in its genealogy as it is sparked across time and space, evolving itself as it propels Africana peoples to intrinsically seek liberation. It is this space in between space. It is of spirit and black liberation one of the many places we can explore and utilize this ancient praxis of NOMO. Africa World Now Project's Tasneem Siddiqui recently sat down with Yosef Carter to discuss the interconnectedness of West African Sufi Islam and Black resistance. The embodiment of ancient ways of being articulated in forms of knowledge that first make sense of the conditions within which Africana peoples find themselves, and second, to struggle against those conditions when moved out of balance. Dr. Yusuf Carter is an assistant professor and Kenan Rafi Fellow in Islamic Studies at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. Dr. Yusuf Carter holds a BS from North Carolina A&T University, a MA from North Carolina Central University, and a PhD in Anthropology from the University of California, Berkeley, and is an expert in Sufism and Islam in West Africa and the United States. His current book in progress, The Vast Oceans, Remembering God and Self on the Mustafawa Sufi Path, examines the discourses and practices of the transatlantic Sufi spiritual network through detailed ethnographic work. Our show is produced today in solidarity with the native, indigenous, African, and Afro-descendant communities at Standing Rock, Venezuela, Corporation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, Ghana, Haiti, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all peoples. Listen intently, think deeply, act accordingly. Enjoy the program. I have the pleasure of sitting with Professor Yusuf Carter, an assistant professor in the Department of Religious Studies and the Keenan Rafi Fellow in Islamic Studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Yusuf, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, I'm excited to have a conversation with you. How are you doing? What's the vibe like today? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, like I usually say to my students, I'm, I'm blessed and highly favored. 
Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I feel good. All is well with me. Alhamdulillah. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Excited for the conversation. And, you know, I wanted to have this conversation with you as I'm interested to talk a lot about like the vast spiritual technologies that Africana peoples use towards libertary praxis, um, towards liberation and toward envisioning and creating worlds that are beyond struggle. And I'm particularly yeah. interested in the spiritual technologies that are emerging out from West African Sufism as part of the spiritual tradition that's linked within a moral and uh, philosophical continuum of what um, Ahmadou Ambatiba terms as the living tradition that flows mm -hmm. out of the spiritual heritage um, of mm -hmm. Africa, leading to new social and cultural revolutions. And you are an anthropologist of religion and your work and your research interests really lie at this in this manner which religious discourses and movements become oriented to the direction of abolition and you're particularly exploring how muslims in the united states and west africa interpret their religion as a means of empowerment in the face of oppression and so i really want to have this conversation with you as you look at multiple sites you're looking at south carolina um, my work is also really you know invested and drawn into the south carolina's low country and georgia's seas islands and looking at the vast spiritual traditions that informed an emancipatory praxis inform the way that we socially are organized and the forms of political governments that we we actually employ so before we kind of get started and kind of get into the 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 nitty-gritty of your research i want to just kind of introduce you a little bit more to our audience and thinking about you know how to map how you map your journey to this work um to becoming an anthropologist to this intersection of Islamic studies and Africana studies and like what were some of your influences that you can recall that drew you to the work some familial mm. or historical or cultural influences yeah well I have to say first and foremost my investment um in this work is not to or through the discipline of anthropology per se um but I will say that um the sort of particular influences that inform my work are as follows, right? So number one, I am um, Muslim, right? A practicing Muslim, which is a, an important qualifier um, and unapologetically so. I'm also unapologetically black and that's the way I work, walk in the world. Um, so those are the two sort of primary things that um, sit at the forefront of how I, of my worldview and my otherworldly view. Um, and as far as sort of what kind of leads me to this point of trying to sort of think through um, and do research on uh, the particular community and communities that I'm interested in looking at are a broader concern with Black religious empowerment, right? Um, over and above identifying structures of violence um, as well as um, certain kind of forms of coloniality and oppression and subjugation that um, impinge on um, the ability for um, Black religious communities to thrive. So I'm more interested in stories that have to do with empowerment, that have to do with uplift, that have to do with um, how people refashion and reconfigure themselves um, and, under, and re understand themselves in, in light of those um, um, structures of violence and coloniality. Um, and so just really quickly, I guess, um, prior to doing my doctoral work, um, I did a master's in history with an emphasis on African and on African diaspora at North Carolina Central University. Um, in spite of the fact that I did my undergraduate work at the North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, Aggie Pride Worldwide. Um, but anyway, um, so I did a thesis project on um, on the Islamic Party in North America, right, uh, which became a, a central interest of mine, um, dating back to the late—I mean, excuse me—the the, the yeah, the late late '90s, early 2000s when I took my shahada, um, and you know, hanging out with um, certain elders who were former members of the party that I met upon my becoming Muslim um, at ANT. Um, I would always ride around with them um, and hang out, and, and they would tell me stories about their their days in D.C. Um, in the early '70s. Um, and one of the things that's important about the the Islamic Party that not many, not too many people 
actually know about um, that organization. It was a primarily, it was a Muslim organization um, that was initiated in the late 60s, early 70s, um, and was headquartered in DC. And it was primarily African American Muslims who understood um, uh, what it meant to be Muslim as necessitating Islamic work, right? So that entailed uh, community care, engaging in forms of social justice um, and, and uh, direct activism, right? Feeding the poor, the hungry, et cetera. Um, but also laying out some very interesting and important critiques about um, white supremacy, right? And so um, they took their uh, political ideology from, or I should say their political philosophy from um, Malcolm X, who they identified as a martyr, as well as their organizational model from um, certain revolutionary movements, uh, Islamic revolutionary movements, such as Jamaat Islami in Pakistan, uh, Ifani Muslim in Egypt, um, and others. Um, and so insofar as the sort of, we see in the late seventies, this sort of move toward identifying in a, a kind of Islamic revolution, um, they viewed themselves as a North American component to that sort of broader uh, conversation. Um, and so I was really, really fascinated by um, the manner in which they, um, we had people who were former, uh, formerly members of the Black Panther Party or the Revolutionary Action Movement who now come to the Islamic Party in the early in the mid seventies um, to engage in this Islamic work with the aim of changing the world, right? Um, and their, um, that experience stays with them today, to, to this day, right? So the, those um, elders, Black Muslim elders who are still with us um, in body, uh, always talk about the way in which that, that experience of, of brotherhood and sisterhood stays with them and they, they you know, as far as I know, every single member has their finger on the pulse of social justice efforts to this day, right? Um, which is something I would say um, quite interesting and, and is unfortunately unusual amongst Muslim Ameri Muslims in the United States, right? Um, insofar as a lot of us are, aren't necessarily as, um, I wouldn't say concerned, I wouldn't say are unconcerned with questions of social justice, but aren't like in the mix, right? Aren't actually like active um, at, or as much as we could be, right? Um, but, but yeah, so anyway, as I'm sort of engaged in uh, and moves to anthropology away from history, just because of being, as far as discipline is concerned, unsatisfied with um, the ways that um, the discipline of history thinks about um, what can be viewed as a source um, in terms of interpreting and thinking about the past, but also the present. Um, I, I moved to anthropology upon the, um, you know, sitting with one of my mentors um, in order to sort of engage in questions of oral history, but also thinking about a history of the present um, and then thinking about other forms of analysis that aren't um, textual or um, based on um, digging through archives, right? Um, and that's, uh, you know, a sweeping generalization of, of history as a discipline in terms of its research methodology or methodologies. But um, at that time period, I was convinced that anthropology had more to offer for me in terms of thinking about how I wanted to engage in the work. So now, I'm interested in thinking about how and studying how um, Tasawuf, as it emerges in those sort of West African, a uh, Sub-Saharan African context, um, affords Muslims, particularly those of African descent, those who are Black, right, in a, in a broad sense of that term, um, a strategy for um, spiritual uplift, for um, engaging in what I uh, think of as a decolonial theological intervention um, that works counter to discourses of race and racialization um, in order to make way for um, an Islamically understood notion of the human being, right? 
Um, and so one of the ways in which, um, one of the ways in which I'm, I'm sort of trying to sort of think carefully about like where my work is situated is that it, it sits at a quite necessary intersection between Islamic studies and black studies um, without sort of um, truncating either um, conversation, right? Um, that is being fully invested in the notion that Islamic studies has much to offer questions about uh, racialization, questions about race, et cetera. And then um, thinking about the ways in which um, questions of critical theory um, and understandings of, of histories of race um, and global trends that, that um, I would say disfigure our, our very notion of what a human being is through discourses of race um, can um, quite forcefully and powerfully inform studies, uh, Muslim studies, right? Um, or Islamic studies. Um, and so putting those two in the conversation, I think is, um, gives me an opportunity to, to, to think um, more carefully about what I'm seeing, right? Um, and then think about how, what I've been blessed to witness, um, shapes my understanding um, and, and my relationship to these varying conversations, academic and, other, and otherwise, so. So there's some threads that I want to sort of pull a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. It's really like, you know, this, this, this portion that you're talking about, the Islamic Party of North America as well, and I was thinking about people that you know, uh, that were involved and have these similar questions, folks like Ronald Judy, who was an um, mm -hmm. active member of the Islamic Party of, of North America. And then recently, I'm thinking also about, you know, um, whether people like Imam Jamil as well, who come to, who come out of you know, the context, Black liberation movements, comes out of SNCC, Black power mm -hmm. movements, and then mm -hmm. think they coming to Islam and understanding yeah. that this, his, his um, sort of, return to his fitrah through Islam was very much in, in understanding the the transfer like the revolutionary transformative power um, of this spiritual practice as part of this broader um, movement towards black liberation that that was a one necessary step for him um right. and so in thinking of that I also I want this this point that you bring up a decol decolonial the theological intervention. And I was wondering if you can talk more about that decolonial inter uh, theological, theological intervention, excuse me, and um, this notion, the Islamic notion of what it means to be human. You know, a lot of us um, in the academy, and I think also like organizers and activists have really taken up um, the work of Sylvia Winter, rightly so, in terms yeah. of thinking about, you know, this distinction between man, the man of men, and then what it actually means to be human and how, yeah. you know, through the process of modernity, right, that is, is required, modernity requires the subjection of Africa and, and all of her inhabitants, right, um, yeah. in order for it to be profitable and in order for it to actually function. And so you see this reconceptualization of all forms of life, right, and then also mm -hmm. the introduction of, of private property, which is something we can also talk about in terms of thinking about, um, you know, uh, movement and, and thinking about also the sort of spiritual curacy that your, your work really sort of covers. So if you can talk more about, you know, this decolonial in, theological intervention and this Islamic notion of what it means to human. Yeah, well, um, so the this question of what is the human being that um, um, Islam offers um, is a, in direct, a direct counterpoint to the consequences of racial capitalism, right? In my understanding. And so I use the term decolonial theological intervention to speak to the manner in which the deployment of Islam um, as a, um, a worldly and otherworldly or an otherworldly sort of um, viewpoint through which to, to engage the world as it is, right? Um, speaks to those sort of structures of, of violence um, that 
attack the human being at its core, right? Or attack our notion of what, or, or I should say, as I said before, disfigure our understanding of what the human being is. And so that sort of begins with an understanding of who God is, right? Allah, right? And so the, um, the under, so the, if we think about like what white supremacy is, right? Um, I, I'd assert that white supremacy is its own theology, right? In which God has a color, right? Um, and a gender actually. Um, and that of course, uh, doesn't jive well with an Islamic theological view, which is that God has no race or gender, right? That we know of, um, uh, or that we, we understand in our sort of very human material sense. Um, God is in no need of such things. Um, in fact, God is in need of nothing. And so the, um, looking at white supremacy as a theology, um, it implicitly um, and inherently argues that um, there's a there's a kind of a hierarchical scheme, right? Where this sort of notion of the divine is somehow fixed to whiteness um, and that that which is not divine, right? Is that which is not white in a way, just to sort of put it simply, I guess. Um, whereas in a sort of Islamic theological view or a sort of a strictly monotheistic view, a radical monotheistic view, uh, is to, to say and to recognize that um, there's a strict um, and um, uncompromising separation between creator and the created, right? Um, that insofar as uh, God is the source of all creation um, uh, and human beings, right, are um, for all intents and purposes equivalent insofar as they have been created by God, right? Um, they all, those that live will all breathe air and will die someday and have their limitations and boundaries and, and what, what have you. Um, and insofar as they are, all are created, right? Um, one cannot be owned by anyone, right? Nobody is, uh, inherently more valuable than another, right? The, the only sort of difference between people um, is th that like matters, right? Is with regard to one's recognition of who God is, right? And one's um, uh, piety and righteousness, right? And so that very sort of um, recognition, that very, um, sort of willingness to invest one's whole self, um, that is body, mind, and spirit, and the idea that God is God, and man, white or otherwise, certainly is not God, right? Works counter to discourses of, uh, uh, colonial discourses, right? That, that through which um, men, particularly white men, have posited themselves as godlike in a way, uh, or not in a way, but just, so um, that, that's how I'm sort of trying to think through um, what I, that, that's how I arrived to this terminology of a decolonial theological intervention. Insofar as the, de, the, the theology, right, through this sort of Muslim, uh, particularly Sub-Saharan West African slash Black, Black Atlantic uh, um, uh, sort of understanding of Islam, which falls quite in line with what, I mean, it's not some variation of Islam, it is, it's Islam, right? Um, inherently is decolonial, right? Um, and so, yeah, that's how I, that's how I get there. Um, there was another um, aspect of your question that I think I lost track of, but yeah. No, 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 because I, I want us to move to these, you know, West African Sufi articulations or expressions of Islam, which mm -hmm. you rightly point out are, are not variations of Islam. And, and, you know, we, I think probably about a year ago, we had um, Dr. Um, Rudolph Ware on our show as well, too, and was talking about this relationship, the sort of mirroring of these ancient comedic spiritual systems um, mm -hmm. and Islam, right? Uh, mm -hmm, and the mm -hmm. continuities of the this spiritual principle and and practices as well. And so when we see this sort of long trajectory of um, 
uh, sort of this this path to understanding, I think, like the divine and the divine order, and and kind of really to to think about the words of um, Hamadou Hambati Ba because he's been on my mind for for quite a bit. And you know, when he's talking about his teacher Cherno Bakar, who who taught him how to read the great book of nature, right? Um, mm. Of humanity, of life, and of relating everything to this primordial unity, right? And it's sort of, mm -hmm. you know, this return to the sense of, of oneness. Um, so I wanted to kind of look at how, you know, these different forms of, of, of knowledge that are being tr transmitted within this West African Sufi Black Atlantic connection, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, and please feel free to, to map histories or progenitors of the West African Sufi movement, because in a lot of ways, yeah. um, and I don't want to overstep or overdetermine it, because when we look at places like, you know, because there's a spatial element to your work that I want to really get to as well, when we look at places yeah. like South Carolina, the Low Country and Sea Islands, South Carolina, Georgia, which is significant, this is a significant place. Um, it's a sacred yes. space within like the African diaspora. And, and uh, you, you know, you talk to people in South Africa, they know about the Low Country and Sea Islands as like a sacred mm -hmm. ancestral community. Um, yeah. And part of that sacredness is tied to the blood, sweat, and tears that went into the recreation of that topography. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so prayers, much, yeah. And, right, and prayers, right? The, mm -hmm. the energy of that space, the connection of that space. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that you can, can talk about yeah. it because you have this contemporary Muslim, West African, a Black Atlantic Sufi community in South Carolina that is mm -hmm. really in so many different ways um, regenerating, right? This practice, yeah. this praxis mm -hmm. of this liberatory movement that has been in this space yeah. for generations. Yeah. yeah. So the 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 name of the community that I that I look at is the the Tariqa Mustafawi, right? The Mustafawi Tariqa. Uh, this is which is a Sufi order that emerges out of Senegal. Which was initiated in 1966 by uh, the late Sheikh Mohammed Mustafa Gai Haider, uh, and was sort of extended by his protege and formal student, uh, Sheikh Haruna Rashid Fai Al Fakir, who uh, in the late 90s, or excuse me, not late 90s, the mid 90s, along with his African American Muslim wife, uh, uh, Umayisha Fai, bring the Mustafawi. Uh, Tariqa to South Carolina. Now, there's a there's a number of things that I have to that I I feel compelled to to point out. So, South Carolina um, is important for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons why it becomes important is because the um, Mosque of Monk's Corner, which is where which is the I guess you could say the 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 central headquarters for lack of a better term of the mustafawi in north america right uh is about 35 miles driving northwest of charleston charleston being one of the more important and points of entry uh, or significant points of entry for enslaved africans um in the history of the, this sort of new world history context right um that is that is in in the united states anyway um and so um what was the other thing i wanted to say so there's a sort of uh th there are uh, this community which is located in monk's corner is comprised of predominantly african-american and west african muslims who whose understanding of practice of the seen and unseen is affixed to um a strict understanding of the sunnah but also is informed by uh this sort of um, understanding of of uh, the spiritual technology technology of the sawaf, right? That has been sort of communicated and transmitted um, from Senegal to South Carolina um, through uh, a number of teachers. Um, now, I wanted to go back to Senegal really quickly uh, because to, to sort of bring us back to this question of decoloniality um, um, and theological interventions and such. So this past weekend was the 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 Grand Mughal uh, in Senegal, and the the this um, religious observation or celebration is observed by millions upon millions of of lovers of Sheikh Hamidou Bamba, right? Who was a um, among other things an important uh, Senegalese Sufi saint um, whose 
heyday is situated in the late 19th century. Um, and upon his popularity um, during um, the sort of French colonial regime, uh, who colonized, who are sort of this colonial power in Senegal, view um, Shah Hamoudou Bamba and his movement, his murid movement, um, as a threat to their power, as a threat to their validity, validity and legitimacy, rightly so. Um, but they fear that he will lead some kind of anti-colonial rebellion um, in spite of his a spiritual commitment to nonviolence. And so he is exiled uh, to Gabon. Um, as he is, and so mind you, the Muggle is, is a celebration of this exile because it's through this exile that uh, Shambhu Dubamba understands that this is the means of his, of his uplift. This is the means of his, the, the increase in his spiritual station, right? Through engaging in these trials, um, willingly, right? Um, but anyway, uh, as he's being um, shipped from Senegal to Gabon on the Atlantic, uh, he informs the French who are holding him that he has to pray. Not now, but right now, he has to pray. The French, being the French, um, want to disengage, disallow him from praying. And so what he does is he makes his ablutions, he takes his prayer mat, he throws it over the side of the boat. And then he jumps over the side of the boat and lands on the, player, the prayer mat. And so he's standing on the prayer mat, right? And so one of the things that I like to, to tell people is that um, we, we think the him being on the prayer mat is in, on, on, on the surface of the water is a miracle. It's not a miracle. It's not the miracle. The miracle is Sha'amu Dubamba prostrating on the water. And so the, the being on the water is not the miracle. The prostration itself is the miracle, right? And so, and the reason why I say that, the reason why I, 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 I sort of make that slight adjustment in our understanding of, of this uh, uh, account of the one of the the, the karamat of of, of Shamo Dubamba is to say that um, in spite of discourses of coloniality, despite notions of white supremacy that assert that um, white men are godlike, right? Shamo Dubamba, in defiance of physical law itself, is attesting that this is not the case. That Allah is Allah, and that no man can be God, right? That in fact, la ilaha illallah, that there is no God but God, is itself then in that context we can understand as anti-colonial speech, right? Now, um, right now I'm teaching a, a, a course called African American Religions um, at UNC. And last week I had my students watch Daughters of the Dust. Uh, and in that movie, in that film, by the way, if those of you who are listening have not seen that movie, please do yourself a favor and watch that movie. Not once, not twice, but three times. Anyway, there's a line in the movie where the matriarch in the film says, uh, this is a story of this sort of Gullah family who's preparing, to, part of a Gullah, fa Gullah family, who's preparing to leave uh, the Sea Islands of Georgia for the so-called mainland, right? And in, in line with this idea of engaging in process, I mean, um, progress and assimilation, into the sort of American body, poli uh, 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 American, you know, body politic. Um, and so Nana Pazant, the matriarch of the film, reminds those uh, family members who are engaging in this process of leaving that they need to remember who they are, that they need to take their uh, understandings of ancestors and memory and spiritual power and ritual with them because it will protect them. Um, and so she reminds them of those so-called saltwater Africans, right, whose very survival uh, was hinged on their ability to remember, their ability to recognize who they are and where they came, came from. And so, and this is, this is why I'm talking about all of this, she says, there's salt water in our blood. There's salt water in our blood. And so one of the things that I uh, think through, and but it's a beautiful film. Actually, a matter of fact, I, I, I analyze it in my book as a way to sort of initiate this question of memory. Um, that the processes of, of remembrance, right, uh, for Muslims of African descent, for Black Muslims, 
in and around around the world actually, but particularly in a sort of Atlantic context with this histories of coloniality, as well as, you know, uh, uh, black displacement, disinheritance, dismemberment, et cetera, as well as histories of triumph uh, uh, and travel, right? Um, and certainly spirituality and, and, and religious power or empowerment, I should say, um, that that strategy of remembering God sets in motion um, the move to remember the self. That it's through remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, zikr Allah, right? Um, reading the, the uh, you know, reciting la ilaha illallah in concert with other Muslims, particularly, you know, so for example, in Monk's Corner, uh, as well as reading the qasidas or spiritual poetry and prayers of Sheikh Mustafa, um, uh, who they understand as their teacher or their teacher's teacher rather, um, affords them a space to which to um, embody um, uh, a, a kind of the fitra, their fitra, right? Um, and so the I think about zikr, right, as a spiritual technology. Um, on the part of Muslims of African descent, that is African-American, West African Muslims, who I sort of want to categorize as if there was sort of broader black identity, black pan-ethnic identity, what, what, what Candace Watts Smith calls diasporic consciousness, um, not as a process of deracialization, but rather a process of rehumanization, right? Um, it's a different project entirely, right? It's one that's, disinvested in hypermaterialism, disinvested in discourses of race, uh, but rather wholly invested in um, a fully nourishing um, and holistic and holy view of the human being, right? One that's not um, mired by pride and avarice, one that's not um, informed by notions of inferiority, um one that's not um sort of um limited by histories of racial subjugation but rather is an, a process of reimagining and refashioning um the 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 self right um and so that's 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 what i'm that's what i'm doing that's that's what i'm working on um and so as you can imagine it's quite necessary for me to put um, Islamic studies in conversation with Black studies. Um, I mean, for me, you know, there's no point in my day where I'm not Black. There's no point in my day where I'm not Muslim, inshallah. So um, this is a very necessary conversation and, and a quite organic conversation for me um, that I don't see as being at odds with each other. Um, as a matter of fact, there's a, there's a, there's a way in which in certain um, corners, I want to say corners, but Black Studies has its limits, by itself has its limits, right? Insofar as those who are focused on the material conditions of Blackness um, solely, right? Um, miss an important story about questions of spirituality, right? And the, and the, and the, and the, the significance of that, right? Um, the very ways in which Black life um, has been made possible um, through spirituality, through ritual, right? Through sort of a religious understanding of one's placement in the world, right? Not as a, in a sort of compensatory way, not in, in, in terms of what some people call spiritual bypassing, but 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 rather um, an understanding of, of the world and the otherworldly, right? Um, an understanding of, of, of uh, uh, you know, what we can call black religion, right? As, as you know, and, and a theological view that God is ultimately just. Um, and insofar as God is just, we are, uh, it behooves us to, us to be just, right? And to seek justice and fight for justice, right? Um, and then Islamic studies has its limitations, right? In terms of, of uh, an over-determining or, or, or a hyper-focus on, you know, um, Arab identities and, and um, um, certain, you know, Middle Eastern or North African geography, um, and it misses a whole 
you know, uh, history and trajectory of, of um, and, and, and the merits of, of Tasawaf, particularly in, in West African context, right? Um, and so, yeah. So I was thinking about a few things um, as you were talking, just listening to you and, and you know, this point of, um, you know, talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of, of this conversation that we had with friend, Fred Moten um, on how communion with the divine while in communion with people, right, is an incredibly transformative experience. It transforms you. Right. You, you cannot mm -hmm. not be transformed. Um, and, you know, and he was talking about this in the context of um, the massacre at Mother Emanuel Church, um, Denmark Basie's mm. church in South Carolina. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and I'm and I'm so, you know, I'm constantly thinking about the location of of this spiritual space, the spiritual center in Mox Corner, which is, you know, right across the street from a plantation. Right. Which we know is a sort of like the social <laughs> spatial expression of white supremacy. Yeah. Um, yeah. and, you know, and, and thinking about this, you know, when you, when you said, you know, salt water is literally in our veins and, and, and to think about when we go back to this Islamic notion and, and I would, and I would argue, you know, um, this is an Africana notion. It's like, it's Islamic notion, Africana notion and, um, mm -hmm. of, you know, the, of the human being as being constituted of earth and water mm -hmm. right and is yeah. shaped through yeah. this sort of divine caress so i was thinking about you know this process of you know this reconnecting to oneself the reconnecting to the earth right the earth that's mm -hmm. within ourselves the aspects of the cosmos that were within ourselves and then this not only a meta like physical connection with with the mm -hmm. continent when we you know and i want us to talk about this process of of travel right um this yeah. this really yeah. like black internationalism in so many different ways that is a, that's an embedded mm -hmm. component of that um and then this you know when i think about travel and then also the possibility of flight and i'm thinking about flying africans and Igbo landing the sort of return yeah. home so it's like these yeah. multiple uh metaphysical layers of yeah. of return right and so you know this yeah. simultaneously sort of this return metaphysical return home and then this physical in a lot of ways, physical return home. And so I was hoping if you could maybe talk about more about this thinking oh, about your, yeah, you're thinking about the ocean too, as this portal yeah. in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Well, no, thank you so much for that question because I I, I actually missed some very, very important things there. So number one, Masjid Muhajirun Wal Ansa. So that naming of the mosque in Monk's Corner itself speaks volumes about the questions of the symbolic, but also the the, the sort of uh, a quite purposeful um um uh sort of uh sort of calling it calls us to sort of attend to the, the those who are from here and those who have moved here right or have been moved here right um in terms of thinking about indigeneity in terms of thinking about political allyship in terms of thinking about travel um in terms of thinking about um refuge right uh the mosque of one's corner mashed muhajirun wal ansar is not situated next to a plantation. It's literally on land that was formerly a slave plantation, Gippy Plantation, and up the street from that, Lewisfield Plantation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so there's a manner in which this Zawiya, or place of refuge itself, in which people of African descent are um, engaging in at will travel and um, possess a certain spiritual religious autonomy is unthinkable 170 years prior, right? In that space. Um, or I should say at least very, very highly unlikely, right? Um, in terms of public forms of sort of religiosity and, um, and whatnot. And so with regard to the question of travel, Right. That also becomes important. That's another sort of element that I'm thinking about um, in my work. Right. How and why West Africans come to Monk's Corner. Right. And how and why African Americans are going to Senegal and within this community. Right. And it's not the only community in which we see these sort of cross Atlantic flows. Um, 
I mean, you know, the Nas and uh, Tijani community, for example, is, is probably at the forefront of, um, well, I don't wanna say at the forefront, but they're a very, very significant community in which African-American Muslims are participating in, uh, uh, in Tasawwuf, right? Um, and uh, view themselves as students of um, one or more West African saints, right? And are sending their children to Medina Bay in, uh, uh, in Senegal, for example, to memorize the Quran, right? And of course, along with that, there are all these ways in which this sort of questions of Africana, uh, African diasporic ident religious identities are set in motion, right? And so this is this is quite uh, similar to that, right? Um, and so, as far as the ocean is concerned, I'm almost, I'm almost, I almost don't want to. Because this is like the punchline of the book of the book that I'm working on, but because I want people to read the book, they're gonna read it anyway. So the 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 name of the book is entitled "The Vast Oceans," um, and it pays um, respect and homage to one of the more prolific qasidas or spiritual odes of Sheikh Muhammad Mustafa Haidara, the founder of the Mustafa Tariqa, which was entitled "The Bahru um, the Vast Oceans," or "The Vast Ocean." Um, and this sort of alternative title is Leave Me With My Love of the Prophet, right? Um, and so it's an honorific ode in which he's celebrating uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, and identifies Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a doctor, as a healer, right? That literally one's love of the prophet, that, that, that one's love of the prophet is the, a gateway to healing. Right, um, that there's a kind of intercessionary relationship uh, between the believer, the do-gooder, and I was using that word for a reason, right? The 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 muhsin, right, um, and his or her beloved, right? Um, uh, that is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, um. As far as the vast oceans are, is concerned, right, in terms of the book, it, it makes a, 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 the argument that there's, a, there's an ocean that we don't know the depths of um, that, offers a certain, that offers a certain way of knowing and being that um, can provide very important, forceful commentaries on the human being, which become very important in terms of um, histories of racialization and coloniality, violence, dismemberment, disinheritance, right? Um, and I mean that in a, in a uh, disinheritance in a, in, a, in a sort of material sense, a corporeal sense and a spiritual sense as well. Um, that that ocean is uh, to south in a West African context, right? Not the only, uh, not the only ocean that offers this, but certainly a significant one, um, particularly against sort of as, as much of um, a significant portion of the knowledge that has been expressed, um, has occurred um, during both sort of colonization, uh, prior to colonization, during colonization, and, and during sort of a sort of period of decolonization, right? Um, that that ocean interacts and mingles its waters with another ocean um, that we don't know the depths of, um, and that is the, the the Atlantic Ocean with its histories of, of black suffering, but also spirituality and black religious empowerment, movement, etc. That these two oceans together have the potential to profoundly impact a third ocean that we don't know the depths of. And that is of the human heart. And so, the title, or, or the work that I'm uh, that I'm um, the book that I'm working on, entitled "The Vast Oceans," makes sort of highlights these relationships as um, it takes shape um, in the context of the Mustafa Wi Tariqa. Um, and the Tariqa that I'm looking at, um, this spiritual network, right? um is 
sort of not the only, I guess we say not the only ethnographic example in which this is taking shape, but certainly I'm trying to sort of talk about a broader, uh, a broader process, right? A, a broader um, trajectory of Black religious movement. And not simply movement in a, in a bodily sense, but movement in a, in a political sense as well, right? Um, there's another, I always do this sort of reading rainbow thing with, with when I'm talking about this stuff, but there's another great book um, that I would like to turn people's attention to, or a number of books actually, that I like to turn people's attention to. Number one is a book, uh, Modern Muslim Theology by Martin Wendt. Very, very important book when you try in terms of tries to think through, uh, for example, um, the point at which Malcolm X learns to prostrate and what that means for him spiritually and religiously and politically. Um, there's another book by uh, a, a, a mentor and friend, uh, Marla Fredericks, who uh, she writes a book called Between Sundays, The Everyday Struggles of, of hmm, Black Christian Women. No, that's not the... It has to do with black um, Christian women in the um, in North Carolina, um, and so she talks about the importance of studying spirituality and and what this can tell us in terms and and not just about religion, but also how, what spirituality and and the reliance on spirituality as a as a as a technology for navigating one's material conditions can tell us about power, right, and empowerment. Um, and so, for example, so these are some of the sort of um, works and conversations that I'm that I'm um, thinking about and thinking through, and um, uh, thinking about how um, notions of the otherworldly and the unseen have real and lasting impacts on our material conditions and the scene, right? And there's something that I was thinking about, you know, as as you're, you know, you're talking about these multiple oceans and kind of going back to this conversation that we had, you know, on history as well. And, you know, I'm very much someone that teaches um, an African centered history and the ways that we think about, you know, um, when we 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 look at how our ancestors understood the process of memory and memory mm -hmm. keeping. Right. And that intergenerational. Yeah conversation or transmission that comes from the divine to the first community to the mm -hmm. next generation and onwards right and so thinking about how the practice of writing history of recording history and a completely and i would say you know really originary sort of register um in a lot of different ways so i was thinking about you know these sort of multiple these various sources and materials that you're using and so we're you know we're talking mm -hmm. about something that's very much within um an immaterial and material registers right that are you know yeah. otherworldly and then and then worldly right and so when we go back to this story to Sheikh Ahmadu Abamba who you know our stories are replete with this right when we look at yeah. um the Africana experience on um you know I think about someone like Queen uh, uh Queen Nanny as well right where she was able mm -hmm. to wage war um mm -hmm. uh in ways where she you know she used parts of her bodies to to deflect bullets and then to to mm -hmm. shoot them back at her opponent hitting the target right that it just bends mm -hmm. this understand and I would say really this sort of European conceptualization of time and space and possibility mm -hmm. right um so looking at you know um these oceans as a sense of the sort of like an archive and so you talk about you know maybe yeah. you can discuss this a little bit as we start to sort of wrap up the deployment and instrumentalization of this you know a lot of different ways these multiple forms of register of knowledge right this esoteric knowledge knowledge and exoteric knowledge right so we, we understand mm -hmm. the deeper one is embodying the the word right the div divine speech um, uh, mm -hmm. that's transmitted through the Quran, right? This book of nature mm -hmm. and this book of, of this pro sort of primordial unity, um, mm -hmm. different aspects of knowledge are opened up, right? Even when we talk about mm -hmm. the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as like a healer and this, and, and bringing mm -hmm. a book of healing, right? Yeah, um, right. So thinking about yeah. how mm -hmm. these various, you know, knowledge systems, West African Sufi, Sufi ethics, how nature and universe all work and serve as this decolonial archive um, in order to really configure an essential self and really a critique of this this notion of a black of black reason. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I want to, I want to, I want to say that. Um, I just want to make clear that I'm, I'm like not studying a, a, a community full of like people who are like have achieved nirvana and are floating above the earth. I mean, is it like I, we're dealing with human beings, right? Who are in, in, in varying places on their journey. Um, and so to that end, um, it's important to note that um, there's a, there's a kind of, in the, in the past, I've tried to sort of use terms uh, to, to think about like, to, and I, I still am, so to, to sort of think about this in terms of like a politics of being, right? Um, versus a politics of becoming, right? So there's a notion of where one is and where one wants to go, right? Um, hence movement, hence travel, hence, you know, um, as, as, so it's not necessarily just about like moving from one part of the planet to the other, Right, um, but also has to do with like the question of this life and the next, right? Um, and so uh, it's about lateral movement. It's about like upward trajectories um, as well. And so often when we think about, um, and I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm that might be answering your question indirectly. Um, but the, so there's this question of like the nafs that we talk about in, in, in the, uh, these sort of um, Muslim contexts, right? Um, and often we think about the nafs as, in like these kind of very spiritual ways in which uh, these kind of very individuated or, or personal shortcomings um, are, um, are sort of... Uh, kept right and and uh, where are where they're situated right so if you're a greedy person if you're an angry person if you're a jealous person or arrogance right this is an issue of the nafs right um but often we don't talk about like what are the what are the material and immaterial consequences of living in an environment that is so structured by race uh that is so shaped by an infrahumanist understanding of the world, right? Um, how does white supremacy, how does racialization impact people spiritually, right? How does it impact people's um, theologies, right? How does it understand, how does it impact and perhaps disfigure people's understanding of who God is, right? And so when we think about, um, or, or in other words, like, if, or in other ways, right, how does the trauma of that, right, impact the nafs, right, which is also important. Um, and so if we're going to talk about politics of, of politics of being, right, in which I'm trying to sort of use um, a, contrive this term to sort of think about like what the nafs also is, that that is the self, the ego, however you want to define it. Um, if we think about the politics of becoming as a process of taskia, as in taskiyatunas, um, the cultivation or the purification of the self, right? Um, this has to do with a sustained uh, regimen for um, spiritual refinement, right? Which in so doing operates both directly and indirectly as a form of resistance to a number of things. One, um, and most importantly, to what we can think of as a, the sort of plantation logics, right? In which the body, and in this context, the black body, black people are seen and valued or undervalued as only bodies, as only flesh, right? And so Tuskit nafs right? West African Sufi ethics asserts um, as other sort of black religious um, uh, sort of movements have, that we are more than just bodies, right? That questions of the spirit are important, if not more important than the body, 
um, that let's, so let's just back up for a second. Let's say through certain forms of struggle, whether, you know, let's just leave it at that. I don't mess up your podcast. Um, let's say certain forms of struggle we engage in and we successfully dismantle uh, structural racism, right? Uh, those institutions that um, make black life untenable, that make life untenable, period. Now, if we have not addressed the ways in which those institutions, those structures inhabit us, first and foremost, before engaging in a dismantling of those structures, right? Are we not hopelessly bound to rebuild those structures in an image that does not look like us, right? That does not celebrate human dignity, right? Um, and so it seems to me that the question becomes, how do we, how do we heal? How do we, how do we undo what has been done? What has been set in motion, right? How do we uh, disengage the process of this sort of ongoing, unremitting disfigurement of the human being that is so profoundly informs um, our sociality, right? Um, can we can we see can we understand can, do we understand the human being apart from race like is that actually thinkable right outside of um uh a, a theology that is not inherently liberatory right what what uh terence um johnson terence l john jackson terence l johnson calls an abolition ethics um when he writes about malcolm x and his uh critiques of democracy um in, in a white American context, um, in relation to world white supremacy, right? Um, I.e., racial capitalism. Um, not suggesting that the two are synonymous, but kind of. Um, and so that's that's what I'm. That's what we're dealing with here, right? Um, how do we get free, right? And freedom, right, is not a matter of. Um, unshackling one's hands or i said not, i should say not just a matter of one shackling one's hands an important part of the process but um the the pro prolific philosophers uh that make up the group uh, uh funkadelic have said that free your mind and your asssl your ass will follow right or as a parliament Parliament, sorry. Um, free your mind and your ASS will follow, right? It's important. There's a, there's a, there's a, a temporal sort of, uh, you know, uh, equation there, right? That before you engage in, in uncaging oneself, right? You have to stop believing that you are uh, uh, in bondage or that you should, or that you deserve bondage. I should say it like that, right? Um, yeah, I, I think, I think that's the, that's the, I mean, it's, it's a broader conversation that about like what black life looks like and can look like and must look like, right. Um, that the community that I'm looking at as an, is an example of a broader conversation, right. Um, that has been happening for the past, for hundreds of years, right. And one way or another, right. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the reasons why um, Sufi Tasawuf in a, in a sub-Saharan African context, or um, that sort of results in a sort of a, a broader discourse that I would like to call Black Atlantic Sufism, because there's an African-American Muslim component to that conversation as well, that shapes and, and, and um, dialogues with to sell up in a, in a West African context. It's not just about like West Africans got all the knowledge and then they're giving it to African Americans, right? There's a bi-directional conversation that, that is being had. Um, so I wanna, I wanna make that clear. But 
um, it's it's through that sort of a broader um, pan ethnic political posture and thus movement that affords one. Um, oh, that's what I wanted to say. So, um, insofar as our very understandings of and, and imaginings of what freedom and liberty is in this place, in this part of the world, um, we would be uh, remiss if we did not understand that that conversation is profoundly shaped through the Black experience, right? Profoundly shaped by the Black experience and through the Black experience. I mean, this is the, one of the you know um, arguments of, of, of Paul Gilroy's The Black Atlantic, right? There are better, very understandings of modernity, right? Hinges upon Black folks as, uh, in terms of their agency and their intervening and their action in the world, right? I mean, the, you know, the text and the idea and, and, and is not without its issues and limitations, but, but a, a, a generous and a generative reading of the Black Atlantic, which is what I would suggest we do, right, points us to this very fact that we cannot we can't understand the United States without understanding the role that religion plays in its development. We can't understand the role that religion plays uh, in the unfolding of the United States without an understanding of the ways in which Black folks have been a part of that conversation, right? And so, talking about Black religious history, Black religious empowerment. Um, is a must. It is obligatory. It is far. It's obligatory, right? Um, if we're going to fix our mouths to talk about life in general, right? Um, you know, yeah. No, thank you so much. And I and I was going to say, um, you know, uh, racial capitalism, the nation state, how we, uh, democracy. You know, these are all bound up with each other they are synonymous with each other yeah. and so for us to think about you know um when we think about revolutionary social transformation and putting human beings at the center of how we organize putting human dignity and a reconceptualization mm -hmm. of what it means to be human um and all forms yeah. of life right um at the center in terms of how we socially organize uh how we govern how we behave how we think we will have a radically different place that we will be experiencing um and so i like this point that you had made up made up um uh, especially as I, you know, was thinking about, you know, someone like Cedric, Cedric Robinson, who, you know, really talks about um, when he's, he's, you know, not talking about sort of a coming revolution that he, you know, is oppressing upon that, the fact that, you know, and he has now passed away, that we were in the midst of, re of a revolution, and that we're already in the midst of war. And that then, you know, there's been no war of modern times that has taken such a great sacrifice of human life and human spirit. Um, as the extraordinary period in which we are passing today. And he's like, some people envision revolution chiefly as a matter of blood and guns um, and the more mm. visible methods of force. But that after all is merely the temporary and outward manifestation. He's like, the real right. revolution um, is within and we're- uh, It begins as in the heart. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. You know, and it's not about whether or not we're in revolution. He's like, we're, that's where we are, but it's how do we, who are we as we come out of that, right? Yeah. And so what does that inward understanding and inward transformation, what does that yield externally? Um, and how is that, you know, happening uh, simultaneously? So, you know, I really enjoyed our conversation. I just wanted to, to ask if you had some last thoughts, um, ideas that you wanted to share sort of where your work is, is moving. You know, I know you're working on a bunch of different mm -hmm. things. And so I hope this is not, you know, our only conversation that we have more conversations yeah. to come. Yeah, well, just the final point. Uh, one of the one of the other sort of interventions that I like to make um, in my work is to betray the um, the sort of popular misconception that Sufis are passive and somehow apolitical, right? That there isn't a commentary on human freedom and dignity, right? Uh, but rather to, to to say that you know there there are um, in, in all manners of Tisawaf. The, the, there are, you know, inherent, um, certainly inherent and, and subtle uh, commentaries on, on human dignity, right? Um, and spiritual uplift and more, way more explicit commentaries um, 
on what it means to be a human being and what that entails and what that uh, necessitates, right? What one has to, to do and certainly not do, right? Um, um, as a, uh, a being created by God um, and also what that has, the relationships to, to like how one treats others and thinks of others, right? Um, and often in spite of what is done to you, right? Which is its own sort of revolutionary move in a certain way. It's, it's not necessarily about like, you know, it's not, you know, uh, some kind of um, uh, different version of, of Robert F. Williams, you know, uh, New Girls with Guns. It's not Sufis with Guns, right? Uh, but rather, you know, Sufis with um, uh, as as in terms of spiritual weaponry, right? Um, that often the enemy is yourself or inside of you, right? Um, as opposed to sort of someone else, right? I mean, yeah, there are people who attack us and, and um, are violent with us and um, participate in certain forms of violence that are um, quite quite explicit and, 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 and subtle. Um, but ultimately, um, the more important enemy is the one that uh, inhabits you. Right, because um, that's where the limitation begins. Right, um, and it's not to say that you know um, uh, certain forms of disinheritance and 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 um, those violences are um, less somehow um, don't have real material conditions and impact people's lives in very serious and um, significant ways, but it's just to suggest that um, freedom is not merely a matter of materiality, right? Not a, merely a matter of what's happening externally. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's much more that, that uh, we could say, but at some point we have to, we have to close. So I'm, I'm gonna shut up. Uh, but thank you so much for having me uh, be a part of this, con this important conversation. No, thank you so much. And, you know, this point that you brought up, uh, you know, I can't help but think about, you know, um, Fanon, who talks about, you know, the, the ways that this, the racism, colonialism, imperialism has affected our psychic landscapes, that gets yeah. compounded um, in terms of even, you know, fighting that sort of, you know, um, the enemy that's that's within. So when we talk about you know the decolonization of the mind as Nugugi Wata Tiongo, I mean it's really a this this decolonization of this, these psycho spiritual states um, that have been really implemented through this process of an unimaginable and incredible violence, right? Um, mm -hmm. That get formalized in institutions and how we organize our society and 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 so on and so forth. So you know, just to think about you know what type of um, arsenal of weaponry and ways that we can fight, you know, fighting and our struggle looks different in terms of the types of planes that we find ourselves in too. So it's like, it's a very expansive understanding um, of how we fight, when we fight and what that was, was going to look like in terms of time and space. So again, I thank you so much for this conversation um, and we will definitely be talking to you soon. Thank you, Youssef. Thank you. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Love Supreme. I will do all I can to be worthy of thee, O Lord.
it has all to do with it. Thank you, God. to resolve our fears and weaknesses. Thank you, God. In you, all things are possible. We know God made us so. eye on God. God is. He always was. He always will be. No matter what, it is God. He is gracious and merciful. It is most important that I know thee. Words, sounds, speech, men, memory, thoughts, fears, and emotions. All related, all made from one, all made into one. Blessed be his name. Thought waves, heat waves, all vibrations, all paths lead to God. That's it for Africa Woke Now Project for this week. I would like to thank you for joining us today and look forward to spending time with you next week. We can be reached through all your regular social media platforms. Email AfricaWorldNailProject at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at AFWRLDNWPRJ. Instagram at Africa World Now Project. Access to our other media platforms can be reached through the bios of our social media. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. The Africa World Now Project Collective consists of international media journalists, executive producer and human rights activist Moiza Muntali, Africa World Now Project media correspondent Funa Ngonda, senior research content contributor and production director Dr. Tasneem Siddiqui, senior research content contributor and production associate Dr. Josh Meyer, associate producer and content contributor Dr. Keisha Khan Perry, content contributor and filmmaker Kurt Orderson, technology advisor and Byron Gray of Greyworks Technologies, and creative directors international creative and artist designer Tabasam Siddiqui and Judah Pope. Africa World Now Project can be heard every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on WSNC, NPR affiliate and broadcast service of Winston-Salem State University. Programs are archived and available on all podcast platforms. Search Africa World Now Project. Until next week, be safe, be peaceful, and above all, be intelligent. May I be acceptable in thy sight. We are all one in His grace. The fact that we do exist is acknowledgement of Thee, O Lord. Thank you, God. God will wash away all tears. He always has. He always will. 
seek him every day in all ways seek God every day let us all sing to God to whom all praises